Hello and welcome to UCL's Centre for Artificial Intelligence 15 Minute Meet series exploring all things AI. I'm Mark Richardson from UCL's Department of Computer Science and I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Professor David Barber who is the Director of UCL's Centre for Artificial Intelligence. David, thanks very much for joining us and for being our first guest in the series. You're welcome. Um, so for those who are watching in the future, I should just point out we are in the middle of the COVID-19 flu pandemic. Um, how are you finding lockdown and what challenges and opportunities has this presented for AI research? I think it's, um, it's quite, quite okay, actually. Um, obviously, it's, it's a bit unfortunate uh, not to be able to physically meet people very, very much. But by and large, I think we're, we're coping quite well. Um, our field is well suited to online collaboration, remote working. So I think we're very fortunate in, in that respect. In terms of, I think, opportunities, um, actually, in some ways, I think this, this uh, virus situation has actually brought out that there are many things that we, we could potentially do uh, in terms of, for example, data analysis around pandemics or uh, supporting, um, you know, sort of different uh, treatment strategies. But actually getting access to data is one of the, the main challenges we have right now, quite frankly. I think, you know, we've been very um, supportive of uh, efforts to actually uh, mobilize people to, to do data analysis. And uh, I think it's been, the response has been quite remarkable, not just from UCL, but from across academics uh, across the UK more, more, more broadly. But we're a little bit hampered by data access. I think there were some interesting uh, potential lessons or discussions to be had in the future about you know how quickly we can get access to data particularly in these very time critical uh, situations so I think that's uh, interesting I think for the future I'm quite hopeful that there's going to be some other opportunities arising from this sort of uh, virus situation I think more uh, automation actually probably will be seen as a, as a natural thing you know how to actually deliver goods and products to, to people uh, you know, without actually having to use individuals, but to have it done more remotely, uh, automated, I think is actually also a, you know, it's a great uh, sort of uh, advantage that uh, we can try to support. Um, so I think there are many good things that hopefully will come, come out of this for us as well. Thanks, David. Um, so one of the things we wanted to explore in the series was the um, academic journey that, that um, AI researchers have been on. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little about about how your career has progressed and um, and where you started from, which I believe was in, in pure mathematics. Yeah, so I, I did maths as an undergraduate and then I started to get interested in the idea of, of AI um, at the point that the neural networks uh, sort of were having their sort of second uh, sort of um, sort of resurgence, if you like. So um, at that time, there were a lot of people like myself, who came from a very mathematical physics style background, who were interested in how these neural systems could uh, could perform in some sense. You know, what, how could you take a collection of these very simple neural like units and collectively that they could do something interesting? So we were very interested in calculating the performance and properties of these these kinds of systems using tools and techniques from mathematics and physics. And I think that was very common, that kind of roots into the field at that time. There wasn't really a very, very large uh, sort of established undergraduate, for example, uh, training programs in, in AI or not that, but that I was aware of, at least at the time. So I think, um, you know, that's been a, quite an interesting route. I think now, obviously, things are much more uh, dependent upon engineering as well as mathematics, but I'm still personally very keen on the underlying mathematical principles. I think that's uh, very important to, to, to keep hold of. Great, and skipping ahead to where you are currently in your career, so you're now the director of UCL's Centre for Artificial Intelligence. Maybe you could tell us a little bit, a bit more about the AI Centre and some of its objectives. Yeah, so we are uh, established basically fairly, fairly recently in September last year, but we've obviously been around much longer than that in terms of doing the research. And we sort of saw this as an opportunity to really help shape the, 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 the field, particularly in, in the UK going forwards. I think that whilst uh, you know, there's been a lot of progress so far, we still feel that there's a lot, an awful lot left to be done. So if you think about intelligence in some sense, you know, where, where are we in the, in the grand scheme of things? I think we're still fairly early days, to be honest. I think we don't really have machines that 
we would like to have in terms of their capabilities. So, for example, you know, their ability to understand natural language, uh, to answer questions, to converse with people, to really uh, sort of understand the physical world around us. It's still very, very early days in that respect. So we've made a lot of progress, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's still a little bit um, superficial. And I would, I would you know, very, very much like to see uh, us at the AI Center driving the, the opportunities and the, and, the, and trying to address those grander AI challenges in terms of how to make progress towards more deeper levels, if you like, of, of intelligence. So that's one of the, the, the key research things that, that we really want to try to address. And that's on the foundational side. I think on the, uh, you know, there's also been a lot of interest recently in the sort of more social, if you like, aspects of, of AI. So for example, how do you ensure that these algorithms in some sense fair and, uh, and, and they're unbiased, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of, you know, interactions we can potentially have there with our colleagues around the university in the, in the natural uh, sort of the, the other uh, departments. So the, uh, the social sciences, for example. So I think there's a, you know, this, these are not questions that we've perhaps addressed deeply even 10 years ago, but I think right now with the sort of, you know, very widespread application of these technologies in society, it's really appropriate that we also try to, to reach out to colleagues, perhaps in slightly non-classical uh, areas for us to sort of really understand how we can sort of uh, you know, make, the, make the most out of these technologies for, for the benefit of, every, of everyone, really. And for people who perhaps not had exposure to a university research centre, what, what does it sort of look like and what in your opinion makes a world-class research entity like the IA Centre? Yeah, actually, so one of the, um, the things that we are very keen on is the idea of collaboration. So it sounds actually quite trivial in a way that, uh, you know, if you don't have the right environment, I think, to foster this kind of collaborations, it's unlikely that you're going to get the kind of synergies that we are hoping to, to achieve. So classically, unfortunately, the AI community has been rather siloed into different areas. So, for example, there'll be teams who work on natural language processing uh, separately from teams who work on, say, computer vision, from teams who work, might work on say information retrieval, et cetera, and, and separately, for example, robotics or control theory. Um, but increasingly, I think if, as we want to move towards systems that we really would like to see in practice, we need to start thinking about how to integrate all of these uh, different kinds of areas and to build some uh, capabilities uh, which actually are embedded when, embedded when the single system so that kind of, uh, if you like, cross-disciplinary research is, is very, very important. And I'm also a strong uh, believer that we, we're not going to solve this just by thought alone. You know, we really need to uh, sort of get the uh, access to the technologies, but also the data sets that actually these systems are going to need in order to be able to demonstrate the kind of intelligence that we, we would like them to have. So... Uh, that means, you know, reaching out to people in the different branches of the sciences, different areas in AI as well, asking them, you know, what are their opinions about how to solve these, these challenges, integrating their ideas with, their, with the available data sets to try to build uh, and, get, and build synergies across these, these areas. So I think that's really, really key. I think um, we'd be very, very fortunate to have the AI Center. Uh, physically, it's a great space. I think it's, it's the first time we've been able to actually all be on the same physical location. And, um, you know, that's a very, very important thing going forwards, obviously, apart from the current situation, but, you know, mm -hmm. that's actually been a, I think it's been a revelation for us, the, you know, what you can actually achieve when you're actually really working together in a sort of, in you know, a purpose-built environment. I suppose one of the defining characteristics of the AI Centre is the engagement with industry. And maybe you could uh, expand on that a little bit and, and tell us about the opportunities for industry to get involved with the AI Centre. Yeah, so I think one of the most interesting things about AI is the applicability of it currently. So there are a lot of very interesting uh, things that industry are working on in terms of their own research agenda as well. So we have a very strong uh, industry relationships, obviously, with the, the large industry labs. That's uh, very important for us. But also we're very keen to support uh, more organic startup cultures and spin outs from uh, the university staff and students. So that's really, really important. And I think 
we've been very uh, good in particularly in the UK historically in, in making spin outs and startups in the AI area. And I think one thing that we need to keep doing is building on our deep AI capabilities and technologies. And we've been historically been really, really good at that. UK has been a, a world leader in, in AI in terms of research and the ability to then generate startup companies from that. It's also been extremely successful. We're really, you know, punching well above our weight in that respect. And I really want to see us continuing to do that. So I see the AI center as a, as a way to support the, the, you know, the national efforts really in, in trying to, to, to generate uh, economic wealth, but also societal benefit as well, not just for the UK, but uh, you know, more, more globally as well. And I think that's really, really important. So a uh, part of that is also a new center for doctoral training that we've we set up uh, at the AI center, where we'll be training a, a new generation of students, PhD students who will be trained not just to be leading researchers on the technical side, but if they want to, and um, they have entrepreneurship interests, we will heavily support them to, to try to become deep tech entrepreneurs as well. And I think that's really, you know, that's really vital. I would be, you know, I really think that for us is a, you know, it's a key performance indicator, the ability to actually impact society and industry uh, through the, through the AI center. Thanks David. Um, so AI is obviously a, a very uh, exciting futuristic technology in, in, its, in its nature. What future applications of AI most excite you? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I think, so there are some fairly natural areas. So I, I mean, personally on the research side, uh, like I mentioned before, I think we're still a very long way away from having what I would consider deeper intelligent systems in the sense that they are not very superficial. So if you think about things like um, translation, for example, from uh, one language to another language, it's relatively superficial at the moment. The machine doesn't really read the text in the original language and get an understanding of what it's really saying and then translate that understanding into, into the other language. Um, and similarly, when we're, we're thinking about things like extracting information from say multiple sources of text and integrating them into some unified understanding uh, it would be much more interesting if the machines actually really started to grasp more deeply what was going on and i think also if you think about uh you know interacting with machines ultimately we really need the machines to have the memories of what we said to them in the past and they need to understand the context of, of our, our personal lives and our, our environment as well so in terms of research, personally, I'm, I'm very excited about that. The, the tremendous challenge to get access, get these machines access to the kinds of information they need to perform at the level that we want them to. So understanding of our cultural environment, our physical world, all this stuff. It's not just about computation. Mm -hmm. It's about the, the data that you need to, 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 to do that. In terms of, um, I would say, applications, so healthcare is a, I guess, is, is an obvious one. I think there are tremendous opportunities in healthcare, uh, but it's another one where an area which is going back to the the, the, the first point. It's a little bit limited by data uh, availability, unfortunately. Um, I think it's a there are issues there, some of which are very natural around patient confidentiality, um, but there are other cultural challenges as well across different communities in terms of getting access to, to data. I'm very excited about things anything which will improve the environment i think that's another yeah. uh, key thing so i'm uh you know the idea that uh you know people are, are dying because of pollution or because of road traffic or car accidents etc this is really i think uh, a terrible situation that i i really hope that we can we can address you know, fairly fairly soon with these kinds of technologies so i think there's really, you know, a lot of positives that we can we can think about from this. Um, I think also techniques which can remove some of the drudgery from, uh, you know, everyday life. Just I don't know, stacking uh, shelves in supermarkets yeah. or you know, putting things in boxes in warehouses. These are ultimately not really, you know, worthwhile uses of a human's life. I think we need to really free humans to do the things that we are uniquely good at you know things like empathy uh, socialization things that machines cannot do um, so we really need to liberate people to to be able to do you know uh, much more interesting creative be much more human and uh, and stop doing you know manual repetitive uh, tasks so anything which does does that and solves those and addresses those yeah. challenges i'd be very excited about 
Well, it's all very, very exciting, David. And it sounds like UCL's Centre for Artificial Intelligence is right at the forefront of it. Um, as you mentioned, this is a, an ongoing series, um, so a 15 minute meet series. And I'm very excited to meet some of the other researchers working in the AI Centre and, and learning a bit more about their research. But um, for the time being, thanks very much for joining us, David. And thanks for giving us an insight into, into your role as director of the centre. Great, thank you. Thanks.